So like I said, we've been in this little New Testament book of Galatians, written by Paul. Uh, It was a letter birthed out of one of Paul's missionary journeys. He, if you flip open to Acts chapter 14, you can do it later. Basically what happened is Paul goes into a couple of these regions of Galatia, and he preaches the gospel to this group of this group of Gentiles, people who have never heard of Christ. And basically when he's done preaching, they stone him. And usually when people get stoned, they die. Paul uh, drags his, you know, barely beating heart corpse uh, out of this city. And his buddies are like, okay, bro, we need to go in the complete opposite direction. He says, actually, no, I'm going to go back into there and preach the gospel again. Because apparently they didn't, they didn't get this, this thing. So he goes back in there, and the second time, he converts all of these people, like thousands of people, that converted to the gospel. And those people are the people who are here that he's writing to, the Galatian churches. And basically, a little bit of time goes by, and what happened after Jesus rose again was the vast majority of Christians were Jewish. They saw Jesus as the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies, and they were converted to seeing him as the Messiah and Lord and God of of the universe, and they believed in him. And then uh, Paul starts preaching to all these Gentiles as well, because you know from Genesis chapter 12 that God said that he would use Israel to bless all the nations, and Christ rises again, And people of every tribe and language and tongue start believing in Christ. So the Jews get a little bit bit jealous. And they start threatening these new Gentile converts with this false gospel that says, actually, if you want to be a Christian, if you want to follow Christ, you you have to obey the law. You have to be circumcised. You got to eat kosher. You got to practice the Sabbath. You got to do all this stuff. And Paul says, actually, no, it's never been about that. It's always been about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came to fulfill the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. I want you to have faith in him. Cast all of your trust, all of your love upon him. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone. And that's what Galatians is all about. So last week, Caleb preached quite well, and he said, in Christ, you have true freedom. So if you take a look at Galatians 5 and verses 7 to 15, that's where we left off. Caleb said that you have freedom in Christ. You have true freedom. You have freedom from the one universal human problem, death. You know, we're all going to die. I'm you know, personally interested in going to the grave with the one who conquered it. And we're free from that in Christ. We're free from legalism. We're free from the need to constantly be worrying about if we're good enough before God because Christ was all of our righteousness for us. So we place our faith in him, his goodness, his obedience, his love, his righteousness, comes here. So legalism isn't the answer. You can't get it through obeying. And you also can't get your freedom from fleeing the law. You can't get it through a life of licentiousness and disobedience and sinfulness. Caleb described it like a fish out of water. Now you think you might be free if you get out of the confines of obedience. But no, actually God loves us enough to give us constraints. It's like a fish, when it's free from the water, is actually bound to death. Same way, you can't get freedom from fleeing the law either. And he concludes the passage right there uh, by saying, walk walk by the Spirit, verse 16. I I don't really like the translation, but. Uh, If you look at a couple other translations, some of you might have the NIV in front of you. It says, so I say. Uh, In light of all of this, in light of this uh, fact that you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not, verse 3, 
13, use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. So I say, verse 16. Caleb said that, you know, last week's text, it's not, we're not quite at the point of putting all of this to practice, but it's really about having a right understanding of the cross work of Christ. When we come to that right understanding, and it captivates our hearts, and it captivates our minds, we understand the extent to which God loved and pursued us to send his only son to bleed and die in our place. At that point, once we're captivated by this, we might actually be transformed. And that's what this passage is all about here tonight. So let's take a look, Galatians 5, 16 to 26. I'm going to read it. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Amen. So Paul sets out right away in verse 16, and he says, So I say, verses, uh, chapters 1 to 3 of Galatians are really this indirect theological appeal to the audience. He's laying out the importance of understanding and rightly believing the doctrine of justification by grace through faith. And then in chapters 4 to 6, he turns to the people and he gives them this direct personal appeal. In chapters 4 to 6. And we can hear that sort of tone right here. Now I say to you, people, you're, you're reasonable people. I want you to understand this. I want you to hear the importance of what I'm about to say. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now I'm going to geek out here for a second just because this is kind of cool. Uh, what's hidden behind this you will not gratify the desires of the flesh is um, it's a little construction in the original language that's unique to Greek and doesn't exist in the English. It's pretty cool. It's the double negative. So in English we, we kind of have that but none of us say it. But in Greek when you see the double negative it means there's no way, no how. Certainly, never, ever. So right there behind you will not, it's, it's emphatic. If you walk by the Spirit, you will certainly never, ever gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, what do you, you want to know what that looks like? You can take a look at verses 19 to 20. If you gratify the desires... You do the works of the flesh. And there's this big list. You don't have to read them again. But basically, there's, they're, they're in three different categories. He lists out a bunch of these sexual sins. He lists out a couple religious sins. And then he lists out a bunch of social sins. So, a couple of the sexual sins. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, orgies. Um, social sins like fits of anger, Jealousy, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, religious sins like sorcery. Uh, I'm not overly worried about there being sorcerers in here. Um, I don't think that's one of the sins you're likely struggling with. Uh, but there are probably a couple on that list that popped out to you in bold. You know, and you're struggling with reading verse 16. 
thinking, okay, Paul looks to his audience and says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and with this emphatic, you will certainly not gratify these desires. So what do I do if I'm tempted by them? Or if I'm falling subject to them? Well, I think there's two things that this verse doesn't mean. Number one, it doesn't mean sinlessness. He doesn't say, if you walk by the Spirit, you won't sin, ever. But if you take a look down at verse 21, at the end, he says, I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who do such things could also be rendered those who make such things their practice. Those who absolutely live for this kind of stuff. Those who can't wake up without making sexual immorality their numero uno priority. He says those who walk by the Spirit aren't like that. It doesn't mean you're sinless. And it doesn't, here's number two, it doesn't mean that obedience is required for you to have the Spirit. In other words, God doesn't wait for you to get to a certain level of obedience before he fills you with the Spirit. But here's what it does mean. Actually, I want to say something else before I say that. So it doesn't mean you're going to obey, 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 and then God's going to give you the Spirit so that you don't sin anymore. That's not what it means either. Because if you think about it, God has never required obedience as a prerequisite for freedom. If you, if you know your Bibles at all, you know that God doesn't do this. He always accomplishes our freedom. He accomplishes our freedom for us so that our desires would be to obey. He did this at the Exodus. Israel was enslaved in the bondage of slavery in Egypt, and he elects Moses to be this representative for them. He separates the, the sea, and they go through, and they get into the wilderness, and they, he swallows up Egypt, and they have freedom from their slavery. Then what does he do? Then he gives them the law. He doesn't give them the law and then say, if you guys obey this, I'll free you. No, he frees them and then gives them the law. He did the same thing at the exile. They had gotten to such a degenerate point in their religious society that they had more gods than they knew what to do with. So God comes in, he raises up Assyria, he raises up Babylon, he removes Israel from the land that he promised to give them, but then he restores them to it and then the law is reinstituted. And then the temple is reconstructed. And then the, the rules come. He frees us and then gives us rules to obey. It's not vice versa. So it doesn't mean sinful, sinlessness, and it doesn't mean works righteousness. But what does it mean? It means that there's a war that we have to fight. Walking by the Spirit means we do war against the flesh. Take a look at verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things you want to do. I don't know about you guys, but oftentimes I feel like the Christian life is kind of this like ping pong match between legalism and antinomianism. It's this ping pong match between man, I feel bad because I'm not obeying enough. And, man, I feel really bad because I've been sinning too much. It's this, I'm caught in between this. I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know about you guys, that's how I feel a lot of the time. And what Paul's saying here is that if we fight this war, this war between the spiritual life and the, and the flesh life, if we fight it on our own, by our own strength, it's going to crush us. The weight between the war, between legalism and the temptation we have to sin, 
it's just going to, it's going to run us down. We have to be aware of the war. And we have to be aware of the things we want the most. And what Paul's saying is, walking by the Spirit will actually transform our desires. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make us want the things in verses 22 to 23 rather than the things in verses 19 to 21. The Spirit's going to do that, not us. Now, I want you guys to notice something. Because all of that kind of seems abstract. Okay? Like, okay, I get it. Um, I'm not, I don't receive the Spirit as a reward for my obedience. Um, this text isn't promising me some kind of life of sinlessness. So I walk by the Spirit. Okay. That seems kind of abstract to me. Um, what I want you to think about is the person and work of the Lord Jesus. Here's why I want you to think about it. Because Christ's fruit, the fruit of his life, if you think about it, was the list in verses 22 to 23. This dude was full of joy. He was full of peace. He was patient with the Pharisees. He was good to the most grungy sinners. He was faithful to his father when he demanded his life. He was gentle with the diseased. He was self-controlled. He said, you know what, Father? I have one desire. It's that this cup would pass from, from me. And yet, he obeys. This dude's fruit, the fruit of his life, was the fruit of the Spirit. But what was his fate? His fate was that of verses 19 and 20. He lived with the fruit of someone who perfectly lives out verses 22 to 23. But he got the punishment of somebody that does nothing but gratifies the desires of the flesh. What do you desire? Let's say you desire acceptance. Well, Christ was rejected so that you don't need to be accepted by anyone else. Let's say you, you desire success. Well, Christ was treated like a failure so that when you fail, it doesn't define you. Let's say you want to be happy. Well, Christ became the man of sorrows so that you could experience fullness of joy. Let's say you want relationships. Well, Christ was cast out so that you could be ultimately accepted by the one person in this universe that matters the most. You feel weighed down by the responsibility to obey verses 22 to 23? You feel caught in between the battle of legalism and temptation? Well, look at the one who should have been rewarded for all of the obedience that verses 22 to 23 to articulate, and yet suffered the fate of the one who lived nothing but sexual immorality. Nothing but enmity, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, orgies. Paul's been calling us to become those who, verse 24, belong to Christ Jesus. And then he brings in this language of crucifixion. I think that's what uncovers this whole thing. He says, verse 21, those who do these things, those who make such things their practice, will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's not saying... In order for you to inherit the kingdom of God, you have to perfectly obey verses 19 to 20. No. He's saying because Christ, Christ received the inheritance, he received the reward of those whose lives looked like verses 19 to 20, so that you 
in some sense, instead of him, would receive the reward of the one who lives the life of verses 22 to 23. And in so doing, you cast your faith upon this person who loves you so much, and you become his. Those who belong to Christ, believers in the one true gospel, not the false gospels that Paul is trying to break down, not the false gospels that we have to cast out of our minds, the one gospel that God gave his one and only son so that we might be delivered from this present evil age. Our, the fruit of our sins was crucified with Christ. So that in our understanding of this, in our becoming captivated by this, in our love for the one who made all this happen, we might actually live by the Spirit. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take you fundamentally believing in, cherishing, loving, hoping in, and glorying in that reality the most. And then your desires will be transformed. It's fellowship with the one who the Spirit rose again from the dead who's going to transform your desires from the the stuff that's in verses 19 to 20 to the stuff that's in verses 22 and 23. Because at the cross, take a look at verse 26. It's it's interesting, isn't it? There's this uh, let us, let us not. There's been lots of commands, implicit, but here's an explicit one. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Very interesting way to end the passage. But if you think about it, they're they're really represented by three things. Conceit, it's pride. Provoking one another, it's relational discord. Envying one another, it's jealousy. If you think about it, at the cross, the one who deserved most to be proud was humiliated so that we need not become conceited. If you think about it, the one who deserved to tap you on the shoulder and say, how come you're not obeying? Why aren't you doing more for me? Why aren't you being nicer to people? Why aren't you giving more money to the church? The one who deserves to provoke you showed you ultimate compassion there. The one who deserves to experience envy. Man, here I am, hanging, when I should be coronated instead of crucified. He was ultimately generous at the cross so that you don't need to be jealous. John Owen wrote this little book called um, The Mortification of Sin. It's an old Puritan word for killing sin. Basically like, if you're a Christian, you need to focus on putting your sin to death. And he pretty much has two premises I read this book with Jill last summer. It seems like not long ago that we read it. But uh, There's two premises in his book. Number one, when you become a Christian, it's got to be your greatest and first priority to kill your sin. Okay, that's what Paul's kind of getting at here. He's saying there's this war. You've got to aim at your sin and put it to death. It's been crucified with Christ, therefore you should crucify it. Premise number two. You can't do it. And you get to the end of this, and you're like, what? You just, you just wrote all these chapters about how I'm supposed to kill my sin, and now you're telling me I can't do it. And he's like, yeah, it's the work of the Spirit. And he says there's really only one thing you can do. He says you run to the foot of the cross. You put yourself under its weight. You put yourself under its beauty. You put yourself under the love that was demonstrated there. It's like Christian who's got this this crazy burden on his back, and you can't get rid of it. 
He's like, I have no idea how to get rid of this thing. And so he goes on this journey to try to get rid of it, and he, he finally ends up at this place where there's this empty cross. And he looks up at the thing, and he realizes the one who was once dead is now alive. And as soon as he realizes this, he says it, it says he became glad and lightsome, and the burden that was on his back went tumbling into a tomb, and he never saw it again. You go there. You go to the place where Christ was treated like an angry guy so that you could be treated like a kind person. Christ was led into the wilderness by the Spirit and overcame temptation so that when you and I fail to, we won't be condemned. But because he overcame, in him, we too can overcome. Christ was put to death for our fleshly works, for our works of the flesh, so that we would live before God with the reputation of those who do Christ's spiritual works. And because of this, we now aim to put the works of the flesh to death. Christ was treated like he lived the fleshly life, so that we can bear the fruit of the spiritual life. The war that crushed Christ, the war between the flesh and the spirit, crushed him, that we might become more than conquerors in him. It's the cross. You want to live the spirit-filled life? Become captivated in the cross. Put your ultimate faith your ultimate love, your ultimate awe, your ultimate desires in the person that hung there but now reigns and is alive. Because you can't do it. But he already did it. And he rose. And he poured out his spirit so that we, in increasing measures, would have our desires transformed. Let's pray.